Today we celebrate the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to humanity. And it is important that we understand why and where. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were very sophisticated societies. The Greeks, the Romans, just name two. The Egyptians had come and gone. If you want to succeed in promoting something, you would find the best possible means of achieving that. So, for example, if you want to cure a problem, a disease, you would find a general practitioner, a very complicated disease, you would find a consultant, and a very difficult problem, you would find a leading consultant. So to solve something, you would find the best that existed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give his last and final message to humanity. So in order for that last and final message to succeed, he should have chosen to send Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the Romans. He could have sent him to the Persians. Because the Persians had a big empire. Huh? He could have sent him to the Greeks. Although small islands, they were world famous for their philosophy they would have understood the message just like this. But throughout the whole world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not choose the most sophisticated people. He chose to send the last and final messenger amongst Badus. Huh? Amongst Bedouins. You know, in Urdu, say Buddhu. Do you know what Buddhu means? Come on, your mom's called you Buddhu before. <laughs> huh? So, Buddhu means not from Buddh that you were born on Wednesday. Huh? It's not from that at all. Buddha means daft. Bedouins were the most crudest of people. The most unsophisticated people on the planet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to send the last and final messenger to the most unsophisticated people on the whole planet. And I often wonder about that. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, somebody said, oh Umar, you've done so well. 
you are now the ruler of several thousands of kilometers of land. Hazrat Umar said, if you want to know the reality of Umar, before Prophet wasallam, I couldn't even get three camels to walk in one line. But since I became associated with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there is nobody in the world like Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala. Huh? Can you imagine? People look for miracles. People look for greatness. Our Nabi did this, our Nabi did this, our Wali did this, our Wali did that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned Abu Bakr into Siddiq. Umar into Farooq. Usman into Ghani. And Ali into Hadri Karrar. Through association. They were all just circumambulating the Kaaba. They had statutes in the Kaaba. The Kaaba unfortunately had become a place of worship, of idols. Lat, Manat, Uzza, Hubul, Huh? Like today we have monkey god, elephant god, worshipping the cow, mashallah. Huh? In those days similar. And those gods weren't doing anything for the people. The people were creating those gods because those gods were their business. They used to make the gods, sell them, and say to the people, look, if you buy this god, means if you give me some money, some dosh, you will be cured of your diseases. And the most thickest of people on the planet used to buy those Gods, thinking that those gods are going to bring fortune to them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chose the most, I can't say worst because that's a matter of judgment, but the most illiterate, the most unsophisticated people on the planet. What did that show? that showed to the history of mankind that when you become associated with Islam, you become gold. And when you are detached from Islam, you go back to your original hakikat reality, which I don't need to remind everybody what our reality is. And why do I say this? I say this because I think it's important that I explain to you uh, the context of Hijaz community. Now, you know, some of us might think we in Hijaz community were so great. Because we're part of Hijaz community. And I think we should try and discover that greatness. And that will be a long process of discovery because we will find no greatness. We are just about to, some of our brothers know, on the 17th of February, soft launch Hijaz community into the world. As you all know, for the last 15, 20 years, 
I have lived a life of isolation, not going out anywhere, not doing all the big speeches, not traveling the world like I used to. For the last two decades, I've been very quietly sat in my room, in my office, preparing a model, a structure of learning where we can learn and we can change our reality. Hmm? So, Alhamdulillah, after all those two decades of work, on the 17th of February is the soft launch date of that work. Inshallah. If Allah wills. And if something happens that I have to delay it, I don't mind. Because I will do it if it's the right thing to do. If it's not right to do it at that time, I'll delay it more. It doesn't really matter. But if we are to launch and people come to Hijaz, people come and say, who are these Hijazis? Who are these people that follow so-and-so? They will come and talk to you and they will discuss with you your own experience. So I just want to allude you to what I think your journey should have been. Not what your journey actually has been, because obviously you all know what journey you've been. But what journey should you have been on? And that journey should have been on a journey in which you have been able to destroy your own ego nafs. So I'm just going to tell you what you should have done. And if you haven't done it, you'll know that you've got three and a half months to catch up. You'll need a crash course. Huh? Of first and foremost, the most important thing is the crushing of your ego nafs, your ego self. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he started the preaching of Islam, he could have waved his hand, he could have turned the whole mountain into gold. He would have become the richest man in Arabia and everybody would have followed him. If he would have said, Allah, they would have said, Allah. Why? Because he's the richest man in the world. But the Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ's companions, went through trials and tribulations to the extent that they had to attach stones to their stomachs because they were so hungry. Prophet ﷺ could have done dua like Bani Israel got man and salva. He could have asked Allah to descend some sustenance from the skies. But no. When you get sustenance from the skies, you become arrogant. You become proud. You realize that you are superior. But Prophet ﷺ helped to crush the ego self of all his companions. Every single one of them. Because it is a law of nature for the tree to grow high, the seed must go lower, the roots must go lower 
into the mud first. The deeper the roots, the higher the tree. The shallow the roots, the lower the tree. Law of nature. The more deeper you go into yourself and you crush your nafs, the higher the tree. And if you say, nafs, knock, knock, who's there? I'm here. How are you? Yes, I've been crushed. Alhamdulillah. Let's move on. You've done nothing. You've done nothing to crush your nafs. To crush your nafs, you have to ask yourself, who are you? There are only two times when you talk to, when you have a conversation. One with yourself, and the second with someone else. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us, when you talk to someone else, always assume that they are better than you. Not that you're better than them. Always assume that they are better than you. When we talk, we always assume we know better than the other person. Job, listen. I have to tell you something. Because I'm important. No. Prophet ﷺ said, when you speak to somebody, speak with humility and humbleness. And when you speak to yourself, not because you've gone mad, because speaking to yourself is the first sign of madness, but we all speak to ourselves. We all speak to ourselves in our head. And we all dream about certain things. We all think about certain things. Prophet ﷺ taught us, whenever you think about your own greatness, think about the worst thing you have ever done. Oh, I'm so great. I did this. Oh, I did that. And mashallah. And you know, my maqam is this. My status is this. No. Prophet ﷺ has taught us, think about the worst sin you have committed. And then answer yourself, you're not so great. Look at that sin you've committed. You need Allah's forgiveness just to even be able to show your face on the Day of Judgment. So you have to destroy your own nafs. The only time Humility is not allowed when you're standing in front of a mutakabbir, a proud person, a dictator. Prophet ﷺ said, it is a sin to be humble before a dictator, before a proud person. You should say those things to break their pride. But in the face of normal conversation, Show humility. And I say this to you because I think that we are heading into the good times. Huh? We are heading into the good times. And the good times means that our examination and our test becomes greater, not lesser. In the times of solitude, you're sitting in your room, you're sitting in your cave, you're sitting in isolation, it's easier. But at a time when things are great, your test becomes greater. It's like I was saying to somebody the other day. I am Sayyid. 
I am descendant of the Prophet I am Siddiqui, I am descendant of Abu Bakr Siddiq. I am Faruqi, I am grandson of Hazrat Umar Farooq. <coughs> I was sitting in office and on the table one was a Sayyid and one was a Siddiqui and one was a Mujaddidi Faruqi, son of Hazrat Umar Farooq. And the three of us, we were sitting and I said to them, isn't it great that we have that great nasab? Great lineage? And the other two said, Alhamdulillah. I said, yes, we should say Alhamdulillah. But this is not a privilege. This is a responsibility. Nasab, lineage, association is not a privilege. It is not a privilege for you to say, I am close to so-and-so. I am so close to so-and-so. That is not a privilege. That is a responsibility. Because tomorrow, when somebody looks at your behavior, and they say, you are so close to so-and-so, look at your behavior. You behave like an ordinary prat. Huh? Is this what happens when you become close to so-and-so? Closeness, association, is never a privilege. Those who are delusional because of privilege. You know who are they? They are under the influence of shaitan. He was the one who said, what's this? I have the association. I stand on the right of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am a privileged individual. <coughs> I have privileged existence. I'm not going to bow down to this insignificant human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, Fakhruj minha fa inna ka rajeem. Get out of here. You are cursed and you are damned. And I was just saying to some of the brothers and sisters the other day, you misbehave. Any one of you misbehave. Forget you. If I misbehaved, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will throw me out of hijaz within a click. Being a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me is a huge responsibility, not just a privilege. And it should be the same for all of you. Association, closeness, proximity, means you have to be on your best behavior when you are interacting with other third parties. And if you don't, I'm not going to be there to see, oversee what you do. I won't. I've got plenty of things to do. Of course, if I see you, I will give you a little clip around the ear and say, behave yourself. Don't worry, I won't hesitate. Because that's my love for you, that I should give you a little clip and give you a strong coffee and say, wake up. Stop being daft. Stop being delusional. But if I couldn't, I hope you all understand the responsibility that you are facing in the future. It is imperative that we as Hijaz, people of Hijaz, and you know the beautiful thing is, 
And the ironical thing is, since the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are the first people that have named ourselves the people of Hijaz, which is the area of Makkah Sharif and Medina Sharif. That whole province of Makkah Sharif and Medina Sharif is called Hijaz. And never before in the history of Islam has anyone identified themselves with that identity. We are the first. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to have identified ourselves. There were Abbasis, there were Amawis, there were plenty of Fatimis, there were Alawis, there were uh, Usmanis. There were plenty of people that had named their associations, but we, since the Prophet sallallahu we are the first Hijazis. Yeah? And if you knew the responsibility that carried, you wouldn't be saying it subhanAllah that quickly. <laughs> huh? You would understand that this is a ton of bricks you're carrying. A huge ton of bricks. And I was just discussing just a few moments ago how the best in our community are so delusional about their Islam. They are so delusional about their Islam that they think, well, I'm a Muslim. Of course I am. Why shouldn't I be? And they don't realize that even being a Muslim is a responsibility, not a privilege. It's a huge responsibility to call yourself a Muslim. I always remember that uh, girl I met who reverted to Islam from Oxford University. She looked like a Muslimer. And she always inspired me. I always remember her interaction with myself. I sat with her for two hours and I was just talking because she didn't look like a Muslimer, but she looked very modest and her, her language was very modest. Everything told me that she's like on a nice journey. And after about two hours of conversation, you know, polite conversation, like all uh, philosophy and this and that and the other, I asked her, I said, are you a Muslim? Have you converted to Islam? Have you reverted to Islam? And for about 10 minutes, she was pulling her face and thinking and, and like, you know, she's like, oh, as if someone's in pain. Literally, someone's in pain, curled up in pain. And after about nine minutes, I said, look, you don't have to answer my question. If, I if I've embarrassed you by asking this question, I'm sorry, you don't have to answer the question. She said, no, I can answer your question just like this. But I've spent the last 10 minutes asking myself, I have reverted to Islam, but you asked me, am I a Muslim? And I was thinking about my actions for the whole of last week, thinking, do I deserve myself to call myself a Muslim today. And I was not sure that I can say with certainty that all of my actions were those of a Muslim. And I said to her sister, you are a thousand times better Muslim or Muslim than I will ever be. She said, why? 
I said, because I take my Islam for granted and as a privilege, you take your Islam as a responsibility in your actions. And all of you, most of you, have been born as Muslims. And I don't think you realize the responsibility that that carries in your actions, in your behavior. Forget everything else. I'm not saying forget your namaz and your roza and your hajj and your zakat and all of those farais. Farais are farais. If you can do one thing in your life, destroy your nafs, destroy your ego self. And if you can't, come to me and I'll help you. You know, they have ghostbusters. Alhamdulillah, I can help you because I know a few things about being a nafs buster. Huh? I can help you a little bit. So, just to help you move forward. In the olden days, and this is true, that when people used to come to the bazoors and they used to say, please do my tarbiyat, I want to move forward in my deen, in my Islam, the first thing they would say, MashaAllah, very good, Alhamdulillah, you've come to learn about Islam, have you? Yes, I have. Okay, go and clean the toilets. They used to make them clean the toilets. Not just one day, two days, five days, one week, one month, two months, maybe five years, go and clean the toilets. Somebody might say, well, that's quite a dirty thing to do, isn't it? Cleaning the toilets. Well, you're only cleaning what you put out anyway, yourself. Just you, because you, you clean your own, and you clean someone else's, it's good. Because that's the best way of destroying your nafs. Don't worry, mashallah, we have somebody to, we pay somebody to clean the toilets. We won't be troubling you to do that. Because we live in a, mashallah, a very advanced society. I was saying to, uh, I think, Freed Sam the other day, I said, if I became a proper nafs buster, I think we'll have zero people in hijaz. All of you would run off. But anyway, we're not doing that. And I think it's important that all of you understand responsibility. And those of you who are listening to what I'm saying, listening means with your ears and with your heart. If you do not discharge your responsibility, I promise you, I will have nothing to do with you. Because we have spent a long period of time preparing ourselves to try and change the world, to become good Muslims. And if we couldn't even change ourselves, what chance do we have of changing the world? So please, whilst it's very good news that we are on the cusp of launching and doing some good things in the world, those of you that are with me on a daily basis, you all know, alhamdulillah, the excitement that we uh, experience every day with all the good things that are happening. But with that goodness comes extraordinary responsibility. And I hope my sisters who are listening to me, you are even more important than the brothers. And the reason for that is, I see the brothers, but I don't see the sisters every day, not all of them. How you behave 
is extremely important. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes Hijaz the epicenter of making people good Muslims throughout the world. Inshallah, I am quietly confident that the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped us all of these years to get to where we've got to through his mercy and nothing else. Only his mercy has helped us to get to where we've got to. I believe that that indication gives me confidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us to succeed in becoming his best slaves in the world. Inshallah. So with those, uh, with that message of Milad al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to the most unsophisticated community in the world and made them the best in the world, I hope that in their reflection, not as like them, because we can never be even as like them, but in their reflection, we can benefit from their light, inshallah. So to finish off, let's do uh, Zikr Sharif and then inshallah we will do Dua.